So good morning, everybody. I hope you had a, a good RubyConf so far. Uh, my name is Matt Immunity. I'm Mervis on Twitter, and these are websites where you can find me. Um, if you have any questions and I can't answer them at the end of this talk, please send me a tweet, and I'll reply to you as soon as I can. Before we start, um, I want to let you know that today is a very special day for many reasons. The first one is because it's Dia de los Muertos. It's the Day of the Dead. Um, so if you're Hispanic or if you like tacos, you might want to really enjoy this day and tonight go get some margaritas and tacos. Um, and if you're Hispanic and if you celebrate, well, have fun. And it's also today my birthday. Um, so um, I, I live in San Diego, California, but my mom is back in France. And she's always worried that I don't have a lot of friends. So I just want to show her that I have some friends. So I'm going to record it, and you guys are going to sing for me, please. <laughs> Happy birthday. So um, in English, is fine. My mom speaks English. You can speak in German, Tim, if you want. All right, so one, two, three. Thank you. It's also Brian Helpkamp's birthday, so if you want to make him happy, go on Code Climate and give it a try. I'm sure we'll be really happy. All right, let's get started. Um, so before we talk about programming languages, I sat down with a linguist, and I asked her, can we talk about human languages? Let's talk about it. Um, I speak a couple languages, but I want to understand a bit more what it means uh, to study languages. And we talked about it, and she came up with this theory that was, um, that was discovered quite a while back by two uh, linguists called Sapien and Worth. And they basically came up with the conclusion that um, the way languages are designed affect the way we see the world, the worldview we have, and the way we behave too. So it seems logical um, when you think about it, but they had to actually prove it. So they did a lot of research. And an example of that is a tribe that they found in the middle of nowhere. I'm not sure where it was. But this tribe didn't have a way of talking about the past or the future. So they could never say, yesterday this happened, or tomorrow we will do that. They were stuck in the present, and uh, the way they would be, uh, OK. We don't, we don't want to hear any more of this. All right. So for those of you who don't know, we just walked in. Today is Matt's birthday. Yeah. They just sung for me. Thank you. Oh, you bastard. <laughs> well, you may have sung for him, but, but did we you brought get him beer. a six-pack of beer? Oh, wow. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Merci. Thank you. Thank you. Happy birthday, Matt. Thank you very much. He nervous when he talks, so. so I have to drink him now? You have to okay. drink him now. Uh, right. yeah. If we can't sing to you, you've got to at least drink the beer. All right. It's noon on the East Coast. Yeah, so we're good. So we're late. Thank you, guys. Thank you. All right, so I was explaining that languages affect our behaviors and the, the worldview. And um, this tribe really was stuck in the present because the language didn't allow them to talk about the past or the future. So based on that, I wanted to study more programming languages, but I'm not a linguist. And I'm not, I was not really good at school, so I wasn't really sure how to do it. But I did what I could, and I came up with a few things. First, I discovered a few things you should not do, at least things that didn't work for me. The first thing was to study a language by just looking at Hello World and say, OK, I don't like it, or I like it. Hello World is a very bad way of looking at language. It's like if you would hear one sentence in one language, and you would judge the entire language based on that sentence. And that sentence might actually doesn't mean much. The other thing I realized is that syntax is a very bad way of looking at a language. It is true that it's the first thing you see. It's, it's true that when you look at a language, you look at the syntax, and you might have a feeling about it. You might react to it. But it's actually not the right way of looking at a language, because the syntax hides a lot of concepts behind it. So how did I do it? How do I think we should do it? Well, I think you first should look at the philosophy of the language. You should think about it. What did, the language, what, what did the language designer was trying to do with his language or her language? Also, you want to make sure you find 
the right use of the language. You don't want to have uh, a Michael Jordan language playing baseball or golf because it just doesn't work. And it's not because of the hands. Actually, Michael Jordan used his hands on all these sports, but he sucked at two of them. Um, so it, it's not that simple. But what you really want to do is to be curious about it and come up to the language with new eyes. Try to get rid of the expectations you have, the worldview you're coming from, and try to look at it like if it was the first language you would learn and try to understand it. So I studied a few languages. I came up with this grid, and it was very boring, so I said, forget about it. <laughs> um, I focused on seven languages, and I was going to talk to you about seven languages, but my talk was about two hours long. And I realized of these seven languages, there are only four languages I really like, um, or that are really interesting, uh, that are very interesting to study based on our knowledge of Ruby. So I decided to focus on three languages, Clojure, Scala, and Go. Then on the second part of the talk, um, I tried to think about how these languages affected the way I write Ruby code. So I do write a bit of these languages. I write way more Ruby code than I write Clojure, Go, and, and Scala code. But by studying these languages and by writing some amount of, of these other languages, I realized the way I was writing Ruby code changed. And my view of Ruby code changed. And my view of maths as a language designer actually also changed. So the format of the talk of the, the, the language study will be very simple. I will take uh, a Ruby class. So this is the example where I create a class with two uh, getters and setters. I have a constructor. I have a start method. At the end, I create an instance of the object, and then I call a method on it. So that's kind of my halo world, but a bit more complex, so I can compare languages and give me an idea of what it could look like. That's kind of my entry point into the language. Now, it's not a good way of judging the language. Again, it's not a way of judging anything. It's just a way to try to to take something we all know and apply it to something else. Then for each language, I will look at a use case. What's the main use case I found for the language? What's the philosophy? What do I dislike? What do I, I like about it? And where to start if you want to learn the language? So let's start by Go. Go is a language by Google that was released a few years ago. It's a compiled language. Um, it's a structural type language. So what that means is that Instead of having uh, functions taking um, typed arguments, the functions will, will take objects that respond to a certain structure, a certain way the object is defined. So concretely what that means is that you can define a function that, would, that could be applied to any object that respects a certain interface. And an interface is basically saying, these are the criteria for my object that need to be respected so I can call this function on that. Um, Go is also an object-oriented language, which might be surprising if you really didn't study Go, uh, but it's a fully object-oriented language, but it's a lightweight object-oriented uh, language. And they really revisited the way object-oriented um, programming works, and they, they took a different twist on it. It's also a fully functional language, so you have higher order functions, um, you have anonymous functions, you have all these things. Um, what you saw Jim do this morning in a keynote, you can also do that with, uh, with Go. Um, not sure why you would want to do it, but you can do it. Learning Go is actually easy to normal. Um, if you have any background in C, it's slightly easier because there's a concept of a pointer, and you might not know what a pointer is. But um, because the language is very small, you actually you, you get in the language really quickly, and you can have fun um, pretty fast. So here's an example of the Ruby class I showed it to you at the beginning, ported to Ruby. So we define the package, which is the name of the application we're in, basically, of the library. Then we import a library, which is like requiring Ruby. Um, then we create a new class, which is the equivalent of a class. It's a type, which is a struct that has two um, members, name and topic, and both of them are strings. And then we define this function, start, that can be applied to a pointer of a presentation class. So here it is. Now we could change that to, to have an interface. So, well. I don't know what's going on there, sorry. Um, so we have this start method that will return a string, and then we concatenate the string based on the two, um, uh, very, or the two members' name and topic for the struct. Then we have the function main that gets called at the beginning when the program starts. We create an instance of talk, passing two different um, 
arguments, so Matt and Go for name and topic, and then we print the output of the function. So it's not too, too hard to follow. Uh, seems pretty simple. It doesn't have all the semicolons. It kind of look a little bit like Ruby, but not too much. So what's the main use case? Um, for me, the best, use ca the best use case for Go is concurrency. And I will show that to you by um, showing the example of a sample code I wrote. And the idea was, I want to call three websites at the same time, and I want to concurrently fetch three resources, wait for it without blocking, and then get all the responses coming at the end. So the code, um, again, we define a package, uh, we import three libraries, and then we define an array of strings that has the three different URLs. We define a new type, um, which contains three elements, URL, response, which is a pointer to HTTP response, which comes from net HTTP, and then an error, so we can um, look at the error if we have an error. Then um, this is the entire code for my application, and it highlights the use of concurrency in Go. So uh, we have this function that takes a, a param, which is an array of strings, and we will uh, send back HTTP responses, an array of HTTP responses. And we create what we call a channel. And a channel is the way Go does concurrency. You basically have this, this concept of a channel that's in the middle, and we're gonna write to this channel and read to this channel. So we don't share memory by talking between the different threads or however we do concurrency. We talk through this broker in the middle, um, which is a channel. So we create a channel that's buffered with a certain length, then we create an, 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 an empty array for the responses, and then we look through the URLs that were being passed, and we start this go function. So this is an anonymous function. That's a go function, meaning that it's async, so it gets started separately. It can be in different threads or not, depending on the system resources. And this function will take a URL, will print it, then it will do an HTTP get, of the URL and will respond with a tuple, which is the response object, and will be the error code um, that might happen if the resource is not available. Then once we have that, we create this object, the HTTP response object that we um, defined before. We create an instance of that and we push it into the channel. So this is the channel we have here. Um, finally, we call this, this anonymous function by passing the URL that was coming from um, the looping we did through the URLs. Then once we do that, we do a for loop. So we just look through, we just basically loop, and we say, if there's anything in the channel, get it for me. And if we have something, we'll print the URL that was, that was coming from the channel, and then we'll append the response to the array, and if we add all the responses based on the length of the URLs, we'll return that. Otherwise, what we'll do is just print a little dot, and slip for a little bit so the loop is not too tight. So that's it, that's the entire code. To use it, we'll have a main function, and we say, call this, your, call, um, get all the URLs, and for each of them, we're gonna print it and see the result. When we compile this code, so in Go, you compile to machine code directly, so you just say, go build, this is the file I have, and you print it out as a, as a, a binary, as a machine code uh, file, and you can see, it actually comes back um, I say I want to fetch this URL, this URL, and this URL, but the, the order they come back is actually different. So we implemented a very nice way without sharing memory of doing concurrency, and Go is really good at that. Go is also good at a lot of other things, uh, but for me that's the main use case for Go. Um, it makes concurrency easy. So what's the philosophy of the language? Well, um, really Go tries to be the new C. It tries to be um, a very simple, very brief language. You don't have to write a lot of code. You keep it very isolated. It fits in your brain, and it's following the Unix philosophy. So taking the, the, the Unix and C as a language to the next level, which is concurrency. And that's really what uh, C is trying to do. What I don't like about, C, about uh, Go, sorry. What I don't like about Go is that it's sometimes a bit too low level. Sometimes I wish it was a bit higher level um, so we could do things. It would be more accessible for more people. Um, there's also the fact that Go doesn't have a really good garbage collector. So if you compare with the JVM, um, of course the garbage collector is not as good. 
it's decent and you can get really good um, performance. It has also a limited adoption, so that's not really true anymore since 1.0 got released and um, a lot of people started using it. Uh, Hampton Catlin, who wrote Hamo, um, used that in his company for a very interesting project. You should talk to him about that. Google uses it also internally and um, they replaced a bunch of C++ code by Go, including um, a project that they have that lets you download Chrome. So every time you go and you download Chrome, the binary, um, they add a C++ front end that was taking all these requests and using concurrency to feed that and they replaced that by Go. Uh, the other thing I don't really like, it comes from the standard library. Sometimes you had some weird conventions that were a bit surprising to me coming to the language. I guess I will just get used to it. So what do I like about Go? Well, the specs of the language are so simple, I actually can get them to fit in my head. So if you compare with Ruby, Ruby is a very complex language, and to actually follow the specs is, is hard because you have a lot of flexibility, you can do a lot more things. Go is simpler. And I actually enjoy that when I write simple code because I know exactly what the language will do and I know what to expect. The standard libraries um, of Go are really, really good. You have everything almost in the standard libraries from a, a proto buffer um, to all the, the net HTTP um, um, libraries. You have, um, uh, you have JSON, you have, you have everything. I can remember, I'm looking for a specific one, I can't remember it. You really find most of what you need, you'll find it in the standard libraries and they really try hard to do that. Uh, concurrency, we saw that. You have this concept of go routines and the channels that are very efficient and a very simple way of thinking about concurrency without having to use locks and mutexes. Um, a lot of the conventions are actually sensitive, even though, uh, sensible, even though I complained about it the first, in the first slide, um, you'll see that when you start using Go, they'll tell you this is how you organize your language. They even have a tool that tells you how to format your code. You can run it and it basically reformats your code so it follows the convention. Um, it makes things easier when you get started and you, when you don't know the language and it also helps when you have a team of people trying to follow the same conventions. Compilation is fast. You can compile a very, very big uh, Go app faster than you can start a boot up Rails application. So it's really, really quick. Okay, Rails is really slow but um, it's still really fast. What's that? No, it's not setting a very high bar. Um, it's basically almost as fast as running a scripting language uh, in some cases. So it's, it's, it's really fast. So you don't really feel like you have to wait five minutes while it compiles. Um, the way you organize the code is flexible. You don't have to do it the, the C way. They have this concept of package and the way things get compiled and the linker is really smart. It's a very nice way of, of uh, doing it, especially when you come from a scripting language. Um, the take on object oriented is actually very interesting and I didn't have time to really spend a, lo a lot of time on that, but I would really challenge you to look at how they thought about object oriented and how you can have types and multi or inheritance the way they do it, which is not the usual way, and how you can share functions between different object types. You also have all the features of functional programming that we love coming from Ruby. Um, the error handling is actually very interesting in Ruby, uh, in, uh, in Go because coming from Ruby or from Java, we're used to raising exceptions everywhere. If you use Rails, you know, if you don't find a resource, we just raise an exception and then we'll do some control flow. In Go, if I just go back quickly, um, you can see here, I was returning, I do an HTTP get and if that returns an error, this value will be filled with, with the error, otherwise it will be nil and I can ac actually ignore it. And the idea is that, um, if you raise an exception, you will need to catch it at a higher level. And now you actually breach the, concern, the, the separation of concerns because code that's above needs to know about the code that's underneath and needs to know how to handle it if there's a problem. And it's not always the right thing to do. So uh, what they do in Go is that you actually have to handle manually the error, which seems a bit odd at first, but I really like it and I'll talk about it towards the end when I will explain what I changed in the way I write Ruby code. Documentation is really good for Go, uh, and you can go in all the packages, you can see how they write their code in Go, and it makes things, uh, it, it makes it for a really good way of learning uh, the Go syntax and how the Go um, authors write their own libraries. So how do you get started? Uh, the website for Go is really good, the golang.org, they have a tour, you can follow the different steps, you do it in the browser, you don't need to install anything. Um, get started, you have a bunch of books, um, the book on the right is a cheap book that was, uh, it's a community book uh, that, that was written by 
um, somebody in the community, the other ones are professional books. It's really easy to get started. I would suggest you spend a few hours just to see if you like it or not and uh, see if it can challenge you. All right, let's move on to something totally different. We're going from C world to Lisp scheme world and we're gonna talk about closure. So who, who actually knows a bit of closure? Do we have a few hands? Okay, so actually a bunch of you already tried closure. So let me share with you my own experience and you might disagree with it, but that's my experience. So closure is a compiled language. It's dynamically typed, but you can also mention um, types. So you can say, this is a function and it will actually return the specific type so the compiler can optimize it. But it's really a dy dynamically typed language. It's a functional language that tries to be as functional as possible. Everything should be um, a list, everything is data. It's not technically really true all the time, but they're really trying hard. It's also object oriented. So that's what people don't always know about Clojure, and actually Clojure people don't really like to say that, but I'll show it to you. It's also object oriented because uh, Clojure tries to be a practical implementation of scheme and sometimes object oriented programming makes a lot of sense. The learning curve uh, for closure is normal to nightmare. And the reason why I put that is because starting is actually not too, too hard. Once you get, you stop thinking about C programming and you understand how to write code, it's actually pretty easy to get started. But the problem I had with closure is as I was learning more and more about it, you need to know more and more functions and you need to have all these things fit in your head and you need to be able to context switch back and forth and that becomes really hard uh, for me at least in the long term. So again, the example. Uh, some example as the beginning, we define here a protocol. So this is not an implementation, this is just documentation. My protocol is called talk and it has a function called start that uh, will return the speaker and the topic. Then I create this record which is basically like a class called presentation that has, uh, takes two arguments in the list, name and topic. Then here I implement I basically say I'm implementing the protocol called talk and I define this method called start that doesn't take any arguments, we don't care about what's being passed and would return a concatenated string of this is, hi, this is the name that's being passed here and I will talk about the topic. Then to create an instance of this record, we say dev talk, that's gonna be my instance, presentation dot, notice the dot here, that's the presentation, mat and, and closure, so this is the list that will basically be um, extracted here and get these two variables. And then I call start talk. So you can see uh, scheme reads from left to right. Okay, so this is the example in object-oriented programming. Now most of the time when you write closure, you don't really write code like that. I just wanted to show it to you uh, because that's what I did for all languages. So the best use case I found for closure is data processing. Um, Data processing is basically the idea of we have data, we want to go through the data, extract some value of that, and uh, process it and, and handle it and do something special with it. Uh, a use case for that is I want to count all the words in a single uh, file name, and this is the implementation. I won't go through it because if you've never seen closure um, or scheme, it might be a bit hard to understand how things work. Just for the record, I had to actually Google that. This here operator is called a thrush operator. And that's it, I just had to Google it, so I wanted to share it with you to show that I know something and I learned something. <laughs> uh, so thrush operator, great. Um, so in this case, you can see the code is not too big and we're processing the data and we're just passing it through different functions. So what's the philosophy of closure? Well, the philosophy is Lisp and Scheme are really good. We really like these languages, we like functional programming, but we want to get something practical. Because fully functional programming languages are awesome, but then it's hard to build concrete things with them to do something really um, efficient. We don't have all the libraries, it's not that it's not efficient, it's, you don't have the libraries, you don't have uh, potentially a good garbage collector, you don't have all the, the things you get from the JVM, so instead of reinventing the world, let's just put ourselves on top of the JVM try to get all the Java developers to come over, learn some, um, some scheme, but also offer some of the flexibility of calling, doing the interop, calling into Java, um, and also doing some object-oriented programming if needed. So what I don't like with Clojure is the fact that I was lied to. I felt, I thought it would be very simple. I thought, oh, I'm gonna be able to 
get this closure thing done in a few weeks and then I'll be an expert in closure. Which turns out, you know, it took me a while and I went, I even took classes and I still feel dumb when I write closure. Like just getting the namespace right, I, I just never get the syntax right, which is another point. It's not always consistent. Even though it tries to be consistent, it's actually not always consistent. The other problem I have is that you need to know a lot of the functions and the macros, you need to know what they do. You have a really good command line tool that will give you the documentation for it, but I find myself having a very small brain and having a hard time keeping all of that in my head and I have to look up for functions all the time. So granted, if I was writing closure every day, eight hours a day, that would probably, after a couple months or years, I probably should be able to handle that, but right now I have a bit of a hard time with that. A smaller issue I had um, is that I was thinking, hey, I'm gonna write web services in Clojure. I'm gonna do cool stuff I'm doing with Ruby, but I want concurrency, so I'm gonna write Clojure code instead. And it turns out that the Clojure community is not really web-oriented. It's really about data processing. So even though you have a few libraries and few frameworks that are interesting, uh, most people don't really care too much about doing normal web, webby stuff. They will do web-related stuff, but more in the data processing um, sense of, of the word. Another big problem I had is the mental context switch. If you go from Clojure to Ruby, uh, from Clojure to Scala, from Clojure to anything, you, you always have to take a few minutes and just think, wait, wait, this is Clojure, this is how I write it. And when you go back to the other language, the same thing. And finally, one thing I really hate, and this I really hate, and I really wish I would fix it in Clojure, is the error stack absolutely meaningless. If you have any problem with Clojure, you have an exception, you have something happening, there's no way you could guess what it is. And at first I thought I was just stupid, so I asked experts and they're like, um, let me sh sh let let's look at the source code and we'll understand what you did wrong. And that's not really the point of having error stacks. So that's a problem I really wish they would solve uh, quickly. So what do I like about Clojure? Well, I can tell you for data processing, this is really awesome. You keep your code very simple, very focused, um, you get it done, it's, you really isolate things and you get good performance. You can also use the Java interrupt, so if you need the library, uh, you need to do uh, crypto, you can actually end up using a Java library. So you have libraries for a lot of things and you can deploy this thing really easily on the JVM. So it's, it's something, um, the, the fact that it's easy to use, it's an easy scheme that's practical and really good for data processing. So how do you, how do you get started? Well, you have a bun bunch of books that are really good. I personally recommend um, you go to this URL and um, you take the CADAS. So it's the, basically a bunch of exercises that teach you the language by going through step by step, uh, solving small problems, learning how to write scheme in Clojure basically. And that's a really good way of learning. And then just take a small project and try to do it in Clojure. All right, let's move on to the last language, Scala. So Scala is probably the closest language we have from Ruby, at least from my perspective. Um, before I get too far into that, I just want to, to stop and, and explain a bit more about, about Scala. Scala is a compiled language. It has static inferred dynamic types uh, and actually also structural typing. So most of the time you would use static and inferred typing. Inferred typing means that if the compiler can guess the type of the object, you don't need to mention it. So um, usually what you do is when you write a method, you say this method take this argument and you will define the, the argument types and the return, you might also want to document it and you, otherwise it can be guessed most of the time. When you actually implement the method inside the block, you usually don't type it. You don't have to actually set the types. So, if you come from Java, or if you know a bit of Java, you know how annoying it can be to, or even Objective-C, have to, to set all the types all the time, and especially when you come from Ruby. Um, Scala comes, basically brings kind of an alternative of in between these two things. The dynamic typing is a new feature. You can actually turn on dynamic typing and just have Scala being written like Ruby. I'm not sure why you would want to do that, but you can do it. It's a fully object-oriented language like Ruby and a fully functional language like Ruby. The learning for Scala is between, the learning curve is between normal and hard. I think to get started with Scala is really easy because you can write Scala the way you write Ruby code. Um, it's, or Java code. It's actually interesting because you end up writing this code, it looks exactly like your Ruby code, and you're like, oh yeah, I can write Scala. And then you take this code and you send that to a Scala expert 
and he looks at us like, dude, this is the worst code ever. Don't do that. <laughs> uh, but it helps you because you feel productive. You start writing code. Um, so I, I was really uh, pushed to learn Scala by Marcel Molino from, from Twitter, and he kind of be became my mentor where I write Ruby code in Scala, which is bad Scala, basically, and I send that to him, and he's like, okay, this is what you're gonna fix. You do this, this way, this way, this way. And it makes the learning faster. However, um, Scala is a very complex, a very rich language, and you have a lot of things that sometimes you might look at and be like, what's this operator, what does that mean? And it's, it's a bit of putting, and that's why it's a bit harder to learn. It's not as easy as Go, for instance. So how does it look like? Well, we define a class called presentation that takes two arguments, uh, named arguments, name and topic, they are strings. Here we say they have value, and basically what that means is that once they're passed, they become immutable values in the class, so we can call them from outside the class, and they won't be changed. Now, my name and the topic won't change through the presentation, so that's fine. Um, we could use variables, but uh, Scala is trying to encourage you to use immutable types if you can. Then we define here, instead of defining a function, we could define a function where we don't have to, we can have a value that um, take all these params, and that's a constructor, and that creates this start object, which is a value. And then we say, I want a new presentation passing Matt and Scala, and um, then I call it talk.start, and it will return the string. So what's the use case? I kind of scratched my head on that one. Um, basically, it's good for service-oriented architecture, and it's whenever you need more enterprise Ruby. So enterprise Ruby sounds really bad for a lot of people, um, but if you come from Java, and if you need some of the things uh, you have in Java, and if you actually build a big thing that needs more than what Ruby can provide, Scala is a good alternative. I'm not saying you should pick Scala instead of Ruby, what I'm saying is in some cases, it might make a lot of sense. There's also a lot of it that you might enjoy in the language, and um, the academic approach of the design is actually also interesting. So to take an example, I'll talk about how uh, Twitter used Finagle. So Finagle is a library that Twitter wrote to handle the service-oriented approach. And this is how they do it. And I don't work at Twitter, so uh, I might be wrong, and they explain it to me, hopefully I, I, I learn properly. But you send an HTTP request, goes through an HTTP proxy, which is written in Scala using Finagle, which is the library, and that's being passed into the API twitter.com endpoint via HTTP. And here, let's say you ask for all my tweets, they're gonna split the request and they're gonna send some of the requests to the user service so they can get some information about you, and they will send another thrift request to the timeline service to get other information. And then from there, they're gonna make some other requests to other backends, and then everything will come back and get grouped together and come back as a, as a response for the user. So they build a system using futures and pipelines. So what's a future, what's a pipeline? Well, the future is basically saying, I will return something in the future, but not right now. So just wait for it. It's like a, it's the same concept of, of a promise, basically. You say, I'm sending something, you'll get it, but not right now, just wait for it. And the pipeline is basically saying you get a bunch of, you send a bunch of requests at the same time, you get them back, and then you, you, you create one response you send back somewhere. So the way they implement it in, in, in Scala, to show a bit of Scala code, is like that. Say, this is my authenticated user, it would return a future of a user, and to do that we call user.authenticate, we pass the email and the password, so that looks like normal Ruby code, but what will happen is that in this specific case, it won't return right away. It would return a future object, but the value of user is not yet available. And then to look up the tweets, we'll get a future of a sequence of tweets, so you can think of it as, as an array of tweets. And for that, we call authenticated user, which is the object we created before. We do a flat map, which is the, like Ruby, um, and then we have a lambda, we have a block, so it's basically like a map in Ruby, but instead of having um, the two pipes uh, to define user, here you say user, and then you have the fat arrow, and we're passing the, ver the value that will be returned by here inside this call. So say, whenever you get the authenticated user, send it to tweet find by all user passing this user, and it will come back. A better way or more idiomatic way of writing this code in Scala is to use the for yield operator. And here we say, um, Get this, whenever you get that, get that um, user, put it into this user 
object or variable, and then call this tweet find by all user and pass the tweets, the response of that in this object, and then we're gonna yield that. So that's how you do async code uh, with Scala in the Twitter library. So you end up with async blocking or not, depending on what you want, futures. You get the full, um, the, the functional programming aspect and the object-oriented uh, object aspect at the same time. Um, this is just implementation of a server. I'm running out of time, so I won't go through it. But um, we basically define a service, we define an address, and then we build a server by passing uh, the name, the codec we want, so it's gonna be HTTP instead of thrift, then we bind it to the address, and then we link it, or we build it using the service, so the request will be sent to the service there. Uh, coming from Ruby, you will see that Scala has a lot of things we already know. You have the concept of enumerable, which is functional programming, basically, so you have all the maps, the inject, uh, the partition, the zip, all these things. You have anonymous methods, or anonymous functions, you have default params, you can do metaprogramming, you can even do method missing, which you probably should not do in Scala, but you can do it. Duck typing, um, you can use mixins. They have actually a concept of traits, which is slightly different than mixins, but it's more or less the same. And it turns out because a lot of Ruby people end up, ended up doing Scala, and because the Scala community just liked it, I guess, they picked up a lot on testing, so you, do, you have good um, testing library like RSpec that's being ported to Scala and um, you also have a built-in testing framework that's pretty good. What you do get that you don't have, and sorry, I should not have put the first one on the list, but you have inner methods. So it's kind of funny when you learn Scala because you will define a first method to say def foo, and inside that you can define def var and call it from inside, but it's basically scoped inside this method. So you end up writing code that lives in the scope of the method that's actually quite elegant when you get used to it. You also have lazy evals and streams, which is the equivalent of Ruby 2.0 um, lazy enumerables. So you can create infinite loops or infinite streams or, or um, collections, and you just keep on going through them until you find what you need. And um, the evaluation is done, um, if you remember what Jim was saying this morning, in Ruby, um, we evaluate the arguments right away. In Scala, you can choose to evaluate them right away when you pass them or later on, and that's how they implemented lazy eva as, the, as part of the language. You have a great garbage collector, uh, which is the JVM one. Performance Scala is way faster than, than Ruby. Um, looking at very small benchmarks on small code I was porting, it was between two to 10 to 50 types, depending on the code you write and what you do. Um, so you get a really good performance improvement and you stay more or less with the same Ruby philosophy. Um, it's also faster, at least from what I saw in the benchmarks I saw, than Clojure. Just so you know, if you do functional programming, I found Scala faster than Clojure, which surprised me. But at the same time, one is, compiled, uh, one is typed, the other one is not, so that's maybe why. And finally, the thing that was surprising was the fact that I actually really enjoyed using an IDE. Um, I use IntelliJ because that's, that's what uh, Marcel told me to use, and I just listened to him. And turns out, um, being able to be inside a function and click on, on a variable and get the entire definition of the variable, what you can do with it, is it's nice. Being able to get the errors being caught before you run, you run them in runtime is also quite nice because that happens in Ruby quite often. You call a method that doesn't exist on an object, and you catch it pretty quickly with tests, but having the tools around the language is actually quite nice. The philosophy of um, Scala is basically Ruby minus scripting plus static typing. That's kind of how I see it. It's probably not the way a Scala person will present it to you, but that's the way I see it. And it's really, for me, the academic version of Ruby. I found that, that Scala, um, being written by a professor at the University of, of Lausanne in Switzerland, has been thinking a lot about what he wanted to do. He wrote the first one of the, one of the first compiler for Java, the one that's still being used, and he applied a lot of this knowledge into the language design, and you don't get the freedom you get with Ruby, but you get a more academic version of it. So what I didn't like with the language is that first it has a huge surface. Learning all the types, the collections, the operators, all this thing actually takes some time. Um, they're not really hard, and if you have Java knowledge, it's much faster, it's much easier, but it's actually huge. The learning curve can be a bit impressive at first. Um, you get started, you're excited, and then you want to do something a bit more complex, and you realize, wait, I don't know what to do here. 
The syntax is often abused, or <laughs> it feels abused. You have um, the colon colon with plus at the beginning, plus on the other side will do different things. You have all these different things that are a bit hard to, to learn. The documentation, not that great. Um, it's funny, but it's just, coming from something academic, you would expect to have good documentation, and I found the documentation to not be that great. Um, now, coming from Ruby, we're used to that, or we were used to that, so it's not a big problem. I felt that Scala tried to do everything and nothing at the same time. The fact that you mix object-oriented and functional programming, I found myself with the same issues I had with Ruby at the beginning, which is, I have 15 ways of doing this thing, which one is the right way? And if you do Python, you know in Python you only have one way of doing one thing, but Matt was really nice and said, you know what, in my language I don't want to force you to do anything, and you're, you're free to do it because I don't know exactly how you're gonna use it, which gave us this powerful language, but when you learn it, and, and that's my case with Scala, it's always a bit hard to know when do I do this, or how, what's the right way of doing it, and is there a right way? I'm not sure about that. And um, finally, the JVM is something that I, I like it, and it's in my next slide, but at the same time, I don't like it. I wish I had something smaller that, was, that I could just ship with my application and would be just lighter and not this crazy big thing I don't fully understand. So what do I like about Scala? Well, first, I feel really close to Ruby or Python. I feel like when I write Scala, I'm not lost. It's not a different world. It's not like when I write Clojure where it's a different men mental shift. Um, it does a lot of what Clojure offers because you can do functional programming the same way you do it in Clojure, you can do it in, in Scala. So I find that for things where I'm not really sure if I want to do fully um, functional programming or not, I would have a tendency to go to Scala because I'm more comfortable with Scala than I am with Clojure because it's more familiar. It's easy to get started because, again, it's close to what we know. Infer types are great because when you start writing your code, you don't feel like the type are just getting in your way or they don't get in your way as much as if you write another language that's, stat that's strongly typed or statically typed. Uh, the functional approach is flexible. You really have a focus on parallelism and concurrency, which you might not have in uh, other languages. Pattern matching is something I don't have time to talk about, but if you come from Erlang, you know what it is. Um, it's something you have in Scala that I find very interesting. Uh, the ecosystem of Scala is quite rich. I found a lot of libraries, uh, probably because you have people like LinkedIn and, and uh, Twitter and other people using it. The community is rich and you can use the JVM and the CLR, which I didn't realize until I studied the language. You can actually run Scala on .NET, which I'm, I will not do it, but you can, which is cool. So how do you learn it? Well, um, you have the tw Twitter Scala School. So Twitter wrote, they have this, this all curriculum to learn uh, Scala when you join Twitter, and they actually publish that, and you can actually do that, and you can follow that. There's a tour of Scala, which you can Google and you find it, that works you through learning the language. And you have the Coursera online class, uh, which, is, which I just finished, and it's really amazing. It was seven weeks of classes that were taught by Martin Odersky, the language designer and implementer of Scala. And um, it was a lot of fun, really good exercises. You can probably, it will probably start again, and you get the, the online classes available probably online. So I'm running a bit of time, sorry about that. How did all this learning affect the way I write Ruby? Because at the end of the day, I still write Ruby more than I write other languages. So somebody asked me this question, and I was thinking about it, and I was like, you know, I'm not sure. Um, and I had a discussion with Brian Helpcamp, because he was writing some of the code, and he was doing it in an object-oriented way, and I said, you know what, we should do that in functional, we should actually use functional programming in this case. And we had this discussion about why and how. The first realization I had, um, and Jim really showed that this morning during his keynote, is that Ruby is as functional as it is object-oriented. Now, it's not purely functional, so maybe what I just said is wrong. Um, it's, it is a, it's, a, it's a functional program, a, a functional programming language. You do not have to have immutable types to be a functional programming language. And um, often when we think about Ruby, we only think about the O aspect of it. We do use blocks, we do use lambdas, we use, um, we use functional programming, but we kind of don't want to call it like that. We want to do everything object-oriented. And I realized, well, this is too bad because we have these two paradigms and we should really embrace them because the language designer behind that wanted us to use these two things because there's value in both. And they are both complementary. We can find, we just need to find the right place to use the right paradigm. 
So when do you do that? And I don't have a really good answer. I can just tell you what I came up with, which is based on the feedback I had from the Scala community and um, articles I read from different people. And basically the concept in Scala at least is functional programming should be used when you extend your program with new operations. When you extend your program with new data, you use object-oriented programming instead. So said differently, if your data doesn't change, you can use functional programming. If your data change and evolves, then you probably should use object-oriented programming. If you want more um, information about that, what I came up with, come and find me at the end, send me a tweet, we can, we can discuss about it. Um, I'm not quite sure I can actually write a blog post to explain with specific use cases, um, but I find that the Scala community was a good community to, to discuss these issues, and I think that as part of the Ruby community, we should do the same thing because we have the same tools. Also, something we probably all know, um, it's not because you can do something that you should do it. Uh, it seems logical, but when you look at a lot of Ruby code we write, we have a tendency to do a lot of crazy things just because we can. And um, I would like to thank Matt for giving us all this flexibility to do all this crazy thing because it's a lot of fun and we can explore it. But at the same time, remember, there's an implementation. You need to run language on top of an implementation. And if you care about performance, if you care about having other people maintain your code, you need to think about the way you organize your code, which is not specific to Ruby. But think about side effects, thinking about metaprogramming, complex code, um, wanted to do object-oriented everywhere. There's a cost to that. So you need to think about it because it's not because Matt allows you to do it that you should do it. Matt is a very good guy, a very nice guy. He wants you to do everything you, you want. Doesn't mean you should. Typing, I realize I actually like typing. Um, I, I remember a few years ago I was saying I would really like to have optional typing in Ruby. I would like to have this option because in some cases, if you have a, form, a method and this method takes an argument called name, it seems logical to you that it might be a string, but it might be actually an object that represents a string that's something else. And being able to define an API and be able to have this API contract saying, my API takes these arguments and they have this type, or they will respond to these methods the same way Go does it, um, and I would actually output this type of information, is very useful in specific cases, especially when you write libraries. If you write web APIs, it's actually also a very good thing to have. Now that's a different topic, but typing is actually not that bad, and it evolved a lot, and now with infer typing, with hint typing, or structural typing, you get a lot of value um, that you don't have when you just have purely dynamic typing. Also realize that testing is not documentation. So a lot of people talked about that. I won't spend too much time on it. Um, but when you don't know a language, going to test and try to understand what's going on is a nightmare. Um, when you go and you look at the source code of a language and you see exactly what the input is expected, what the output is, actually it helps a lot. So you should keep on testing and you should write tests, but don't forget to also document the way your software, your program behaves and what is being expected. I'm not, explaining, I'm not asking you to document every single line or the inside of the method, but ex explain the outside of it. Error handling, I talked about that when we, we looked at Go. I have a tendency now to return this tuple, an array of two objects. One is the object that comes back from my method and the other one is a potential error that, that can be raised, that can come from the object. So you can actually create an exception object and not raise it. You can just send it and let other people above it handle it. So usually I have a tendency to do that in my libraries, the way I do it. So I will make a request. If something goes bad, I will return it as an object and I will decide if I want to raise an exception or not or if I want to just pass this information back to the people who will use this library and they can decide what they want to do. I'm not fully sure it's a good idea. I just feel like using exception for control flow is not the best idea ever, all the time. It's actually probably a bad idea, but there's some cases where it makes sense. So let's move on. Compilers. Actually, I realize compilers are much, fun, fun, much more fun than they used to be. Um, they don't get in your way as much as they used to, or at least maybe I just got better. Um, and I also realized that if my code can be optimized for the compiler. So if, if my compiler can understand the way I write my code and can process that, it also means that my brain will also should be able to handle it better. 
So I, I started changing a little bit the way I write code, and I started keeping my structure simple. So if you have an array, in Ruby you can put any types in the array. You can actually start passing different types of objects, um, and if you have a compiler, usually compilers don't like that, or you need to, to put a special thing in your object when you, you send that. And I realized, well, I could actually write Ruby the same way I would write Scala, for instance, and just th choose one type and stick to it in most cases, and it would actually keep my code much simpler. I don't have to check on the type of the object that's being passed. I don't have to do all these things. I end up with simpler code that um, actually ends up running also faster. And this is when I realized that once again, simplicity matters. And Ruby gives us a lot of flexibility and a lot of options to do really complex code, but we also have the functional programming aspect of Ruby, which forces you to keep it simple because you cannot build something very complex with, well, you could, but it looks ugly really quickly and everybody will yell at you if you do that in functional programming language. But if you have 10 layers of abstraction in OOP, people won't really complain about it. If you look at a lot of Ruby code, we have this very complex code with 10 different abstraction layers, and people think, hey, well that's good, look, I, my method is only five lines or three lines of code. But actually, it's not that simple, because when you look at the object graph and how you call these methods, it's very complicated. So functional programming is one way of helping that, and, and what I'm trying to do now is, when I can, I keep my code simpler by sometimes switching to functional programming for a very specific use case. So at the end of this journey, I, I found myself pleased because I came to what I find are some of the limits of Ruby, which is good because in everything you have limits. And if you understand these limits, that means I can pick what's best when is the best time to do that. And I came up with three points for what I think the limits of Ruby are. Performance, concurrency, and freedom. So performance is an issue we know, and it's actually a hard problem because it's very much like concurrency, is based on the language design. You cannot, everything is a compromise, and you cannot have something very flexible and also very performant. Or you can, but it's really, really hard, and it would take a long time. Um, so you need to choose. Now, performance is a word that means everything and nothing. I, I realize that um, people think, well, that means Ruby is slow. Well, Ruby is slower than Scala, than Go, and Clojure. But you know what? It's, most of the time, it's fast enough. And I write web services, and I did that for Sony PlayStation, and I do that now for Living Social. And we get a response time between 5 to 15 milliseconds writing Ruby code. This is fast enough. I cannot justify, even though I would love to just play with these other languages and write some of my services with that, I would not get a much, much better performance gain by using other languages. Now, concurrency is where it gets a bit more tricky, and a lot of people talked about that. I won't go too deep into it, but there is a bit of a problem with Ruby at this, at this level. You can get concurrency different ways. It doesn't mean you can't. I'm just saying that languages that came after Ruby, like the three we just studied, they have, they, when they were designed, they thought about concurrency. I'm sure when Matt started designing Ruby in 93, or when he released it in 93, he was not thinking, well, concurrency is a big deal, and that's gonna be the future of programming. He had threads, and he has, uh, we have a lot of cool things in Ruby that allow us to get concurrency. We can use multiple interpreters, we can do a lot of things, but the, the language was not designed the same way newer languages are designed. And the last one is freedom. Freedom is what I get when I write Ruby. Freedom is me, is basically Matt's letting me make any mistakes I want and not getting in my way. It lets me explore what I want to do the way I want. But there's a cost to this freedom and I need to be willing to pay it. In most cases, I'm willing to pay it. In some other cases, I can't afford this freedom and I will choose to restrict this freedom by choosing another language that makes compromises that are different. So at the end of the day, looking at all these things, I realize I'm not a Ruby developer anymore. Actually, I'm not even a developer. I'm a problem solver. But actually, that's what people like to say. And I thought about it, and it actually sounds bad. I can, I can imagine this guy you know, on this small desk in a wide room with a small window just solving problems. And people just bring little problems to him, and just like type, it's like, yeah, I fixed this problem. And you know, if that's my life, that's a bit sad because I don't want to be just solving problems all day long. What I want is to build products. I want to build something. 
Um, and I'm not talking about the startup concept of I want to have this app and I can make millions off of it. I just want to build something, something that, that would change the world around me or just a few people, something that would make my life easier or somebody else's life easier. So you know what? The language you use is just a detail. You can use Ruby, you can use Scala, you can use PHP. Whatever language you use, you can build a great product. The only difference is that if you don't choose wisely the language, the way you will solve this problem will be affected because languages, as we saw at the beginning, shape the way you solve problems. And solving problems is the way you build products. So choosing a language can affect the end result of your product. So you need to be curious and you need to learn new languages. And the reason why you want to do that is because you want to think about how to build products differently. You want to solve problems different ways so you can end up with other results. And there's nothing wrong with looking at other languages and going back to the one you like and say, you know what, I still write Ruby. There's nothing wrong with Ruby. Or in this specific case, I'm going to take another language because it solves this problem differently and it makes sense. But what's very valuable is when you learn other things and you go back to the, right, the way you write Ruby, and now you write Ruby code in a way that's even more efficient or that seems to fit better your brain, it's just a really good feeling. So go and build awesome stuff with whatever language you want. Design your own language. Have fun with it. Understand the, the concepts behind it and just enjoy building stuff. Thank you.